or you know prevent all data breaches right right or my personal favorite after after a data breach is we take your security seriously right right <laughs> After they've been breached or after there's been a breach? After they've been breached. After they've been breached. I had to ask. I had to, you know. (laughs) Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of John Has Trust Issues, where we talk about issues relevant to the worlds of authorization and zero trust. My name is John Martinez. I'm the technical evangelist at StrongDM. And today I have the amazing pleasure to have with us Nat Shear of Craft Compliance. Hey, Nat, how's it going today? Good, John. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Of course. Yeah. So um, we, to start out with, Nat, we have a tradition on the show where we talk about our trust issues. So what's your trust issue today? Well, as often as I'm on LinkedIn, the easy answer is anybody I don't know in a direct message. But more in general, I think I'd have to say just cybersecurity marketing as a whole. <laughs> I've seen, you know, the slogans of stuff like, you know, we will ship with zero vulnerabilities right. or, you know, prevent all data breaches. Right, right. Or my personal favorite after after a data breach is we take your security seriously. Right, right. <laughs> After they've been breached or after there's been a breach? After they've been breached. After they've been breached. I had to ask. I had to, you know. <laughs> and then all the news articles are coming out about the shortcuts that they've taken and the, you know, the n- numerous times that they were, the security was asking right. for more budget and they weren't giving it to them. Right. But it's okay. They take security very seriously. So I just, I have tremendous trust issues with all of that. With the, yeah, well, I, you know, I'm going to back you 100% on the <laughs> direct LinkedIn messages, of course, you know, especially the ones where they ask you about, you know, some new investment opportunity and there's a PDF in the message. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to click on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I guess they try, right? <laughs> um, so Nat, um, Let's get right into it. So, you know, tell us a little bit more about, you know, you talked about LinkedIn, but, you know, tell us a little bit more about your background, uh, you know, and, you know, your work. Uh, if you want to get into that, that's fine. Um, but really, you know, LinkedIn, obviously, for all of us, you know, that have been around, doesn't do our experience justice, right? You know, we've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> so give us a little bit more beyond what LinkedIn says about Nat Sheer. <laughs> Yes, I've done a lot of stuff beyond LinkedIn, and there's probably some stuff on LinkedIn that may be a stretch of what I've actually done as well. But <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so yeah, I was uh, born and raised in Indiana, uh, spent five years in New York for grad and undergrad. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Yep. Um, coming from Indianapolis, which I always figured was a big-ish city, mm-hmm. and then going to New York to have everyone just accuse me of being a farmer <laughs> just because I'm from the Midwest. Right. <laughs> but uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it's where I met my, my wonderful wife. Awesome. Um, so awesome experience. Um, but yeah, we spent one year in a studio apartment paying Manhattan rent prices before we decided this was enough. Yeah. And uh, she's also from the Midwest, <laughs> so we moved back to the Midwest, cool. and that's where I got my first uh, security consulting job cool. as a pen tester. And uh, have been doing pen testing ever since. Um, I do. I think it's a very valuable experience. Not Mm -hmm. everybody is is not um, not necessarily possible for everyone to do this. But um, I started as a consultant, but then I was able to move for a couple of years to be Mm -hmm. as an engineer, kind of plugged in with the developers. Mm -hmm. I was still doing the pen testing, all the security testing, the same things that I was doing. But now instead of writing a report and just handing it off to a client, I was writing the report and then basically hand delivering it to the developers sitting down saying, all right, let's go through this. Yeah, You know, it gave me a really interesting perspective of the developer side of things. It wasn't, I was no longer just the security team saying, you know, why aren't you fixing this? You know, every, every, you know, uh, every sprint, why isn't every sprint prioritizing security and to realize, Oh, you know, development also has their own projects. Yeah. And they're not just sitting around waiting for security to give them stuff to do. Right, right. No, I mean, the, the, you, I mean that, that's great that that's, you know, that that's how you, how you eventually got, you know, into doing what you're doing, right? Because it's like, I mean, as we both know, right, I think you alluded to this a little bit, is that usually it's, you know, security or somebody like you throwing a hot potato at the developers and, okay, go figure it out, right? Throwing it over the wall, if you will, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it, it, it's, you know, the, the, the collaboration between the two, I mean, it's, you know, I, we, I think maybe we've gotten better as an industry. I don't know if you have an opinion on that, but at least you tried, right? <laughs> I tried, and it was it was a great experience. Yeah. And I loved the company for for bringing me in um, right. and doing that that way. Right. Um, but um, I think I think overall, as an industry, we are getting better, yeah. right? There's always that shift left, sure. you know, talk. Sure. And as long as that's not, you know, the we're just pushing security to the developers and right. you know giving them more to do, but we're just you know we're starting to start those conversations right. and be more collaborative with the different teams and departments. Um, I think I think that's what you know we really need to strive for. For sure, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, you talked a little bit about getting into pen testing, right? Why don't you give us a little bit more? You know, like talk about um, what's the day in the life of a pen tester? Uh, what is pen testing? Help us define that for our list, our watchers today. Sure. So, penetration test, pen testing, penetration testing, sometimes also called ethical hacking. Mm-hmm. Um, it. In the end of the day, it's just a um, basic quality assurance testing mm-hmm. that focuses on security, right? We're going to try to find vulnerabilities, um, different security issues with the application, with the network, and we're going to try to do that before a hacker does. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that way, then you know you're making sure that your your data is secure, your users are secure, yep. um, and nobody's using your application for mm-hmm. nefarious purposes and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a day in a day in pen testing. Um, fortunately, I even you know in my current role, I'm right. generally able to keep my day mostly um, empty of meetings, right, maybe right. one or two. Yeah. So I am kind of be able to be hands down on the keyboard, you know, lo- actually actually testing. Right. Uh, I will say it's nothing like Hollywood or you know the movies or anything like <laughs> right. that. Uh, right. We're not finding critical vulnerabilities, you know, every five minutes. Right. <laughs> it's a lot of studying. Yeah kind of both when you're testing and when you're not testing. When you're not testing, you're studying, you know, to learn the newest techniques and tricks yep. and all those sorts of things. Yep. Uh, when you are testing, you're studying the source code. Yep. You're studying, you know, the web applications and how it's supposed to function. Mm. You're studying the user roles and requirements and definitions and all that sort of stuff. Yep. You're sometimes studying, um, you know, long error messages. Mm-hmm trying to understand, you know, exactly what triggered what and why and how maybe you can manipulate it. Um, at, for, when I'm doing, uh, you know, access control uh, testing, mm-hmm. I'll sometimes have four or five windows open right. with the application open in different roles, um, trying to understand, okay, this role makes this request, right. but this right. role makes this request. Now, can I repeat it with, you know, the other role and those mm-hmm. sorts of things? So it's a lot of window juggling. I definitely yep. recommend screen space. Yeah, I, I bet, right? Or multiple screens, right? <laughs> if you can, yeah. Yeah. Do you have one of those setups where it's like, you know, the, and, and again, I don't want to portray a version of security, right? We're both in the security world, right? But, you know, the 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 Hollywood uh, view of security where, you know, we've all got, you know, walls of monitors and, you know, things like that. I am I am not on the level of walls of monitors. <laughs> I, I still stick to my just two two monitors here. The two big monitors, but right. still, yeah. Just, just the two. I know Hollywood, it's either essentially a wall or like a tiny phone-sized tablet that they're just typing away on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ne- um, neither one is realistic at all. Right, right. Well, that's good, man. Yeah, thank, thank, you, for, thank you for the description. Um, in, in your profile, um, you do write about being an ethical hacker. I, I, did, I did see that in your LinkedIn profile. But, you know, something stuck out to me really um, is that it, you're, you're an ethical hacker with a goal, right? And your goal is to make the internet safer for people. And I really like the connection of, you know, making it, you know, the connection to people, number one, right? You know, at the end of the day, you know, it's all about people using the internet, you know, and that that's a lot of, obviously a lot of what we do in the security world, right? But then you go on and you say, making it, making the internet safer for people to pursue their goals and their opportunities. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, for me, it's kind of my why um, for mm-hmm. security. I think in the security industry, we can very often lose that focus of why we're doing what we're doing. The point ultimately is not just to patch vulnerabilities. The yeah. point of security is not to you know have on your dashboard it to say zero vulnerabilities or anything yeah. like that. Yep. The point really is to get people to be able to safely use your application, to safely use the website or the network or whatever it is. And, 
in essence, to safely do the right. jobs that they're trying to do. Right. Um, and I think for the internet, is especially, um, it's it's so much opportunity on the internet, whether from remote work, right. from training, from library, you know, library resources on the right. internet, right. for um, uh, training for school, colleges on the internet, all that sort of stuff. Being able and and. Once it's on the internet, you know, almost anybody can access it. Yep. You don't need to be, you know, at Harvard campus right, right. to be able to take Harvard classes sure. anymore. You can be in sure. wherever you want to be. You can sure. be in the library mm -hmm. um, where, you know, in whatever small town that uh, is available. But mm -hmm. all of that is only possible if one, people can use the internet and the application safely. And that two, that people trust it, that when they go onto a computer, right. they feel secure in what they're doing. Yeah. And that, you know, as soon as they start typing, their passwords aren't going to be stolen. Right. Their credit card information is not going to be stolen. I mean, you know, identity theft is a huge, huge problem. Right. But if people felt that every time I go online, my identity is stolen, they'll stop going online. Yeah. And then they lose access to all those amazing yeah. opportunities and, you know, the yeah. freedom of the, of the information that is available. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, I 100% agree with that. I mean, it's, you know, one of, one of the things now that I've got aging parents, right? The one of the things I think yeah. about is, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, and, and may, maybe this resonates with a lot of our, our watchers today or a lot of our, the people that are watching is that, um, you know, I think of my dad, right? My dad is the one person in between my two parents that, uh, you know, will get distracted by that email that comes in promising whatever and he goes and clicks on it <laughs> right um so i i absolutely i absolutely totally get what you're what you're getting at um and you know i kind of a kind of as a question here along the same lines um you know what i what i deduce from your answer is a little bit of something that the security industry has been notorious for right and that's usability right you mm -hmm. know and, and it's something that well we're making things safer right but you know, what, what about the, the user experience? You're, you're, I think more broadly, right. You're talking about the human experience as it relates mm -hmm. to security, right? You have any thoughts around that? Well, it's the age old adage, right. That the most secure laptop is one that's, you know, turned off, unplugged, locked in a safe and then buried a thousand feet underneath the ground. Right. right. Um, but, but right. But of course that's no longer a usable laptop. Right. Um, I definitely think, you know, security does have problems with that. Yeah. Um, that I mean, even to take a relatively recent example, um, right? The after CrowdStrike, and they took you know basically denial of service to all of their mm -hmm. clients. Um, right. They had the CEO running around saying, "Well, it's not a security incident." Right. Well, okay, but actually, availability is one of the key principles of right. security. We right. we want things to be available to the people authorized to use right. them. Right. And when you take things down, denial of service. Yeah. So as a pen tester. Right we almost never test yep. denial of service yep. because no client is sitting there going, you know, I'm going to pay thousands of dollars for somebody to take down my network. Yeah. Generally we'll say, you know, Hey, we found potential issues for denial of service. Right. We're not going to test them. We recommend you take a look at them and patch them or what do whatever mitigation. Right. Right. But that is something denial of service attacks are a legitimate form right. of, um, of attack. They can right. be used to, um, uh, I think, uh, you know, Twitter recently, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. had various style of service attacks yeah. try, trying to limit, you know, their their um, ability to have certain uh, calls or whatever it was. Um, and uh, it's it's definitely a way that attack, attackers can get at, uh, at your service. So, yes, availability is definitely one of the key principles right. of security. Right. And uh, we want to make it secure, but available. Right. Or and, and available, I should say. Right, right. Yeah, that, that, that's a good, yeah, let, let's qualify it, right? And available. <laughs> right. We, we, want to, we want it to be both. Um, right. All right, let, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, here here on the show, I talk a lot about, and, and it's basically because of the background that of, you know, of StrongDM, where I work today, right? And, and mm -hmm. we talk a lot about zero trust. And obviously, zero trust is not a new concept. It's been around for a while now, right? And it's meant different things to, you know, different parts of the industry, right? You know, it kind of started as, you know, like, let, let's let's build zero trust, you know, again, yeah. about the marketing comment from earlier, right? Into yeah. into our yeah. perimeter security gateway, you know, you know, firewalls, basically, right? And, you know, so the firewall part of the industry obviously latched on it really quickly, right? And it's really the origin of where it comes from, mm -hmm. right? But, um but from your perspective, from the, the penetration testing perspective, you know, what, what does zero trust mean to you? 
So it starts with not trusting even the client. Um, more than once I've gotten, you know, say an external or an internal scope, they say, here are our subnets, mm -hmm. you know, this is what we want you to test. Well, I go do a little, just, even just a little bit of, you know, open source uh, research and find, you know, there's actually these other subnets that are externally available, yep. says you own them right here. Yep. Would you like us to test these or is there a reason you excluded them? Yep. And sometimes there is a reason, you know, maybe that's their point of sale service or something is that no, 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 we don't want you to, to test those. We don't want to uh, have any risk against those systems. Yeah. But sometimes legitimately they had no idea, right. right? It was somebody set that up years ago, lost was lost in the asset inventory and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, we've had somebody provided us a scope and we did some verification on it and we came back and said, um, you know, I, our apologies, but these ones are showing up as listed under the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. Can you verify you own these? Because yeah. without a very, very clearly worded, yes, we own these, we are not touching these whatsoever. Right. right. <laughs> so, so, so for zero trust for us, it's, you know, starting with not trusting the clients, right. you know, I, everything that they give me, everything, that, everything that they right. provide, I'm going to verify, yeah. I'm going to validate. And then once you're kind of into testing, right. So especially and then working with the developers, right. very often it's say, well, this is how it works. Right. Say, so, okay, I don't trust you. Yeah. Let's test it. Let's see that that's right. how it works. Right. Um, I had one application where it was, you know, a, a it, it was basically a checkout process. Mm -hmm. So you could pick different items and then you know go through a whole checkout. And um, so in the application, I was testing and I was looking at it and going, well. There's nothing stopping in the source code here. I'm looking at the source code. There's nothing stopping you from putting in a negative number at the end of your, your checkout process here, right? right? Ch changing your shopping cart to a, you know, I'm paying a hundred dollars. Right. Actually, you're paying me a hundred dollars now. Right. And they said, well, no, it, it won't work that way. Right. So, okay, <laughs> let's try it. So as it turned out in our application, in the application, there was nothing, it would have worked, right. but they were actually outsourcing the actual credit processing in order to not have to handle all the credit card information course, locally. Yeah, yeah. And on their end, they said, wait, this is a negative number. We're not going to process this. Right. <laughs> so, okay, yes, it didn't work, right. but not technically for the reason that the developers thought. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's, it's, uh, it, it's don't, don't, don't trust the source of, uh, of, of the things that come, you know, by your desk or by your computer screen. Right. Um, and so kind of related to this, right. You know, it, it's, you know, identity security is a big aspect of zero trust. Obviously, it's all about, you know, verifying, you know, validating, you know, and doing that continuously, right? Um, again, as it relates, you know, to to your your part of security, right? You know, what? Tell, tell me a little bit about, you know, your views on identity security and what you do there. Sure. Well, so for identity security, I kind of always tie that back into web applications mm -hmm. and user roles, because mm -hmm. that's kind of where I, I spend most of my mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, and in nearly every web application test, there's some problem with user roles and user permissions and right. stuff like that. Right. Even when the even when they're very basically defined, right? Sometimes these days you get these elaborate matrices of permissions right. where there aren't any defined permissions. It's just a hundred different types of permission you can have. And so you can have any combination or permutation right. whatsoever of the permissions. And of course there, there's always some issues. Right. Uh, there's just the, the options are so numerous. It's impossible to test them thoroughly. Mm -hmm. uh, but even when it's just kind of a, you know, basic user, visitor user, admin user, mm -hmm. there's almost always some admin functionality mm -hmm. that the basic user or the visitor user can mm -hmm. access that they shouldn't have access yeah. to. Yeah. So in that same mode, it's kind of a, you know, your zero trust in throughout your, throughout your uh, process, mm -hmm. you're going to be validating both the person is who the person says they mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. and that they have access to whatever functionality, whatever data. Right. And you want to really be doing that at every possible step that you can, both right. in the functionality, retrieving the data, right. looking at the session, you know, throughout. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of have an aside question, right? You know, uh, so is, is it, um, the kind of thing when, you know, you, you come out with your, uh, you know, your, your, your pen test report, et cetera. Right. And, and is it the kind of thing where people are like, oh my God, here's, here's what, what am I going to find <laughs> in this thing? Right. Is it like one of like, um, are they happy or are they like, you know, not wanting to like look, or is it a combination of, of things? 
So that really depends on the client and what yeah. their goal was to begin with. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. So I kind of, to, to simplify it a lot, yeah. there's kind of two categories of clients. Right. There's the ones that really care about security. Right, right. And for them, it's a, you know, please, whatever the, whatever the report is, I'm just happy. If it's, if it's super red, then I'm happy to know about it and we'll get it fixed. You know, if it's right. super green, then I'm, again, I'm happy that you tested right. and I'm glad that everything that we're doing is working, right. those sorts of things. Right. Then the other side that is really just doing this because compliance is telling them they have to do it and it's yeah. just a checkbox. Gotcha. Those are the ones where if they even open the report, <laughs> oh my goodness, they are going to argue <laughs> right. every single issue, both on whether it is an issue, right. what how risky it really is. Right. I mean, critical critical or high, forget right. it. It's just going to be a, an hour call yeah. where they are just going to grill you like you're sitting, <laughs> like you're sitting in the, like you're sitting in the witness, right. witness box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, this part of the code really is vulnerable, but no, let's talk about a compensating control instead. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I totally get you. I get it. Well, I, you know, I, I, I do like the, you know, the ones that are your, your clients that are most much, much more happier to see the report, right. And what, you know, is there and what they can fix. Mm -hmm. right? And, and with those clients also, I mean, there, there is a legitimate back and forth sure. conversation when, sure. when I deliver a report. I, so it's standard industry practice, I believe, mm -hmm. but so we certainly do it yeah. where we deliver a draft report we mm -hmm. call it a draft mm -hmm. because we actually do invite that yeah. collaboration, that conversation yeah. of, Here's what we saw. Right. Are there some mitigating controls? Are there some factors that we weren't really able to understand or see from our perspective right. that would reduce some of these risks? Right. Um, I don't think I've ever had a client actually encourage me to increase a risk. So, <laughs> but maybe it's, sure. maybe it'll happen one day. But yes, yeah, so sometimes it, sometimes yeah. things do get reduced a little bit right. um, because there are mitigating controls or something like that. Um, and um, but those when when the when the uh, the client really really is interested in security right. and not doing it for a checkbox, those conversations are a joy. It's sure. it makes my process better. It makes their process better, um, and it's just a wonderful wonderful experience. Love it. Um, and so my my next question here is one as I was reading your uh, your newsletter. Right, you have you have a LinkedIn newsletter. What was the name of the newsletter again for everybody? I don't know if we have an official name or anything. For it, <laughs> I thought yeah, there was a name. Jack but... Clients newsletter, yeah. Yeah, just 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 go to Nat's LinkedIn uh, and and you'll see it linked from there. And you, you you're you're always you're always posting articles in there, right? So that's great. But I, I read your recent piece, and um, I really love the title that you have on there. Kind of talking a little bit, you know, back again at the at the human experience, at the usability aspect mm -hmm. of security, right? I really like your take where you 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 titled your piece we have a negativity problem in the security industry, right? You know, and mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed reading it. And, you know, I obviously, you know, having been in security myself for a long time, you know, guilty as charged, right? You know, it's, it's always it's always easier to talk about how, you know, the world, your world, you know, client, you know, user, whatever is going to end if you don't do X, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and, and, Besides, you know, by the way, you know, I really love the quote that you have uh, from the movie Ex Machina, right? Huge movie fan here, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you really caught my attention there, right? Um, so knowing all of that, and maybe you want, you know, if, if you have the quote handy, you know, you know, you could, you could, you know, tell us a little bit about the quote. But, you know, I really like the aspect of testing, testing, you know, the, the character's badge. I forget his name, but, you know, testing the character's badge around, you know, it's like, well, you know, if the door opens then you were meant to go through there. Right. If the door doesn't right. open, <laughs> right. Then don't, but you know, I, and I, I really love the aspect of how, you know, the, the host was, you know, encouraging him to test his badge, you know, to places. Mm -hmm. Right. And I really love the positive reinforcement aspect that you bring out in your, your piece that you wrote. Right. How would you rephrase the concept? Now with that as a backdrop, how would you rephrase the concept of zero trust? If you were, recreating it in a more positive tone. Yeah, I still like the zero part of it, yeah. but um, I'd probably phrase it maybe as zero concerns or zero mm -hmm. worries, yeah. um, zero hassle or something like that. Yeah, so I like that um, that scene has always stuck with me from Ex Machina. So if, if yeah. any, anyone listening who's not seen the movie Ex Machina, it's a fantastic movie about AI. Um, and so one of the things is this, the main character and Nathan, I, uh, sorry, Nathan is the guest, I think. 
think. Nathan is the guest. Uh, so he's at this house um, by this billionaire tech startup guy who's building this robot. And as you'd imagine, the, the house is fully in, in, um, Internet of Things, like everything is automated. Yeah. And so when Nathan arrives, he gets this key card and the, the host says, yeah, just on, on a door, right. try it. If it lets you in, you can be there. Yep. If it doesn't let you in, that's not where you're meant to be. Yeah. You know, zero like, oh, and don't you dare try, you know, if, if it buzzes <laughs> right. at you, how dare you have tried to be so right. like, no, if they, that's secu- that's the job of security, right. you know, that's not where you're supposed to be. And that's fine. You figure that right. out. Now you can walk around the house, feel completely comfortable, try it on a door. If it opens, great. If not, that's not where you're supposed to be. Right. And it's yeah. not that I'm then monitoring you on the side no. going, I, I don't believe it. Five times it binged on, binged on him. He's clearly sneaking around. Right. And that's kind of that same attitude, I think, with employees, with users, mm-hmm. whoever it might be. It's a we're going to make the clearly defined, you know, this is this is the kind of areas that you're you're not authorized mm-hmm. to be in. Mm-hmm. But that's not because we don't trust you. Right. It's not because we don't want you to succeed. Right. It's just not relevant for your job function. Right. We want you to succeed. Right. right. That's why we're giving you what you need yeah. so that you will do the best and not be distracted by these other things. Right. Ooh, that's also, I like that one. Zero distractions. Zero maybe. distractions. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, and I mean, you, you, you bring up an interesting point, you know, and then obviously this is your job every day as, as a pen tester, right? You know, you're, you're, mm-hmm. I mean, it, I, I guess an analogy for those that are watching that are not, you know, technical or, you know, you know, they're kind of thinking about getting into, into the, the, the technical world specifically in cybersecurity, right? It, it's, it's, your job is to literally, uh, the, the the analogy I have in my brain is like testing locks, right? Your job is to literally test locks, right? See what opens yeah. and, you know, all of that stuff, right? Um, and I know for myself personally, right? You know, the way I got into technology in general, but security specifically was, you know, it was my curiosity, right? You know, my my curiosity about what this lock does or, you know, using the, the, the analogy or the metaphor, right. But it's also, what does this piece of code do? What does, you know, this command in, in, in Unix do, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And so I, I don't know if that resonates with you, but you know, I, I'm, I'm guessing it does. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. So I started in math. Um, yeah. I kind of take, I took the long way around a little bit. Yeah, so yeah, I started yeah. in math then got into more computers mm-hmm. And I always loved the logic, the puzzle solving, the kind of investigation and research side of all of that. But I was never theoretical. And once I hit, you know, the undergrad and graduate mm-hmm. level math courses, mm-hmm. it's all theoretical. Right, I mean, right. I, I learned how to find the distance between two points in n dimensions. Right. I've never used that in my <laughs> life. I'm I'm still waiting for the back end admin portal that right. says solve this solve this integral and we'll let you write right into the admin portal. It's, it's never happened. Right. I'm hoping, but it's never happened. So you know, so as as you know, as an undergrad, I was quickly, you know, moving, trying to keep keep that same principles of what I was doing, but right. keep moving towards something more practical. And that led me to cryptography, which led me then into right. computer security and ultimately pen testing. Right, right. That's cool. That is really cool. Um, so um, a, l- a little bit, you know, kind of kind of on that same vein, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Kind of along the vein of, you know, promoting curiosity, you know, from people that are possibly wanting to get, you know, and, and, and replace, eventually replace me, replace you, right? You know, we have to kind of pass the torch eventually, right? And, and mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I personally do have a huge... Uh, I, I guess I should say a huge goal to mentor people, you know, and kind of bring them into the fold. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, so what advice would you give someone who's wanting to get into cybersecurity more generally pen testing more specifically? Uh, what, mm-hmm. what would be, what would be Nat Shear's, you know, mentor, you know, uh, uh, uh advice here? So I have started getting this question a few times now mm-hmm. on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's a great question. Mm-hmm. Um, my first advice is because I'm not in recruiting. So mm-hmm. I know when I've looked for jobs mm-hmm. for years back, I know what the job market was then. Mm-hmm. But I'm, no, I'm not up to date on kind of exactly what the job market is always looking for today. Sure. So my sure. first advice is always um, connect with people who are recruiting, especially in cybersecurity, if you can and network with them and really get their advice as well, first right. and foremost, because they're going to know 
not just kind of what it's been doing for the past right. 10, 15 years, but what it's doing today. And that's most relevant for you. Right. The other thing I always say is use the opportunities you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. There is a huge debate about, you know, uh, entry level jobs mm -hmm. and what skills are necessary and, you know, what certs you should have mm -hmm. and all those mm -hmm. sorts of things. It, we could debate that for weeks sure. and weeks and not come to sure. a conclusion, really, because the industry is just kind of so fractured on it. Sure. Um, but what you can do is take advantage of what's in front of you. So right. if you're in school, study hard, right? right? That's right. your that's your job right. right now. Take advantage of whatever you can. Find an internship or two. Get that additional experience. If you're at a job already, mm -hmm. every every uh, company, every job has something mm -hmm. to do with cybersecurity mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. So talk to your IT department. If, if you have a cybersecurity team, talk to mm -hmm. the cybersecurity team, see if you can help out, see if you can watch, you know, even, even just to be a right. fly on the wall in a meeting or two, right? Again, express interest, make sure they understand that you want to learn and you're not just trying to exfiltrate data or something right. like that because they're on, they're on the lookout for <laughs> right. that sort of thing. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but show that interest because right. if, you can, if you can take advantage of some of that in your current job, then you start building those skills without having to move someplace right. else, without having to go through the process, the headache of looking for a new job, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. If you start to love it, great. You can keep yeah. moving towards that route. If you yeah. don't, you can stay. You have the comfortability of you know the current job you have. Right. And then as you have time, start looking at uh, additional education, start looking at certifications. If you, it, again, if you have time for that, I think it's a great, I've said often certifications are a great way to get your foot in the door, yep. but what, but you are the one who actually has to get the job. Right. You are the one who has to do the work. Right. So ultimately it's your skills and your experience right. that is going to be the most important. Love that. Love that. Um, I'm not, I'm going to ask you the, I'm now going to ask you probably the shortest question on my list and probably the, the one that's the most profound question on the list. Right. Um, and thank you for being a great sport today, man. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, but what's the thing you're most proud of, proud of? Well, it's a little cliche, but that one's pretty easy. I, I am most proud of being a husband and a father. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. My, my son turns five this year and, uh, it's, uh, it's exciting. It's, it's quite an age. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Being, uh, being a dad myself, I totally, totally get you. That's so awesome. Um, you know, we're, we're about to wrap it up, but before we do, uh, anything that you'd like to plug on the show? Um, Anyone listening? I'm yes, I am very active on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me. Send me send me a DM. Uh, please introduce yourself first, because otherwise I will have no idea who you are. <laughs> um, and yes, uh, we uh, so not on my page, but on my business page, right. the Craft Compliance. Right. Um, we do send a a, a biweekly newsletter about uh, something relevant in cybersecurity. Uh, also, link some of the, some security news that's relevant um, at the bottom. So it's a Pretty good way to keep up to date um, with with security, but it's not going to spam your spam your inbox every day. Absolutely, I, I can totally vouch for the the newsletter. Definitely <laughs> sign up, and and for those watching, we will have uh, uh, Nat's LinkedIn links uh, in yeah. the description of the show, so you can get to those pretty easily. Uh, Nat, thank you so much, man. It was it was such a treat thank to have you, you on the on the show. Um, well, that's it. That's another episode of John has trust issues. This episode is brought to you by StrongDM, the modern access management platform that enables continuous, and I'm going to use the word, Matt, zero trust <laughs> authorization for your infrastructure. Thank you very much for watching. Whoa, how did I get into this little box here? John Martinez, your security barista here. Hope you enjoyed this episode of John Has Trust Issues. Make sure you like and you subscribe to the Strong DM channel to get more relevant content like interviews, like more John Has Trust Issues episodes, like product walkthroughs for Strong DM, etc. And you can see all that by subscribing and liking our content. Thank you very much.